Hello everyone, my name is Zach, and if you're watching this, you want to learn how to design yo-yos. Hence this title, and this video. First of all, I would like to go on record by saying that yo-yos are complicated, and designing them is hard, but anyone can design one. There's no secret, and there never has been one. The information needed to design a yo-yo exists out there on the internet, and a stubborn enough person with enough time and resources on their hands can figure it out on their own. The goal of this video, and the ones that come after it, is to make it so that you don't need to be as stubborn, rich, or bored to figure this stuff out. With that said, let's get started. First off, you need to define your goal. Document exactly what kind of yo-yo you're trying to design, and what traits you want it to have. You're going to need to specify the mass, the outer diameter, the width, the type of bearing, and the type of response you want the yo-yo to have all the while keeping in mind what category of play you want your yo-yo to be used for. Don't put flowable and a J-sized bearing in a looper, or make a 150 gram off-string yo-yo if you expect to have a normal design experience. Most of the time, being excessively different isn't worth the hassle. Good? Good. Also, on a side note, um, the metric system, the SI system, is what is generally used for yo-yo dimensions. There are exceptions, but things like width, diameter, and mass are usually denoted in metric, even if such is not the standard in your country. Now that you have all that jazz written down, and I mean written down properly, napkins get lost and crayons get smudged. Use a pen and paper or a digital pen and paper or a chisel and a granite slab if you are feeling confident with yourself. It's time to draw out roughly what you want your yo-yo to look like. For this part, I've decided I want my yo-yo to be used for 1A, weigh 65 grams, be 56 millimeters in diameter, 45 millimeters wide, and I want it to have a C-sized bearing, and use what I will loosely call standard response, because even standard response isn't very standardized, but I'll get to that later. Draw a box proportionally as tall as half the diameter of your yo-yo, and proportionally as wide as half the width of your yo-yo. You are now going to draw a quarter of your yo-yo, except you are not. Please do not do this yet because it is time for the suffix in the title of this video to become important. This is a screenshot of a finalized yo-yo design in a modeling software, which I'll go into in a later video. See this festival of lines and numbers? These are what I like to call the guts of the yo-yo. Making a fabulously crazy mistake anywhere but here in the yo-yo design can usually be marketed away as a quirk or some other intentional specialty of the design. But a mistake in the guts makes a worse yo-yo than you set out to make. End of story. The rest of this video will be dedicated to making sure you don't mess up this part of the yo-yo. Got it? Good. I'd like to start with a disclaimer. There are a ton of variations of the standard yo-yo guts that have occurred over the years in the hundreds of companies and thousands of unique designs that have been manufactured since the ball bearing revolution began. And mine may not be the same as many others out there. In fact, some of my clients have come to me with pre-existing designs for their guts that, despite my best efforts to convince them, they chose to keep despite slight deviations from what I would call the optimal design. But the dimensions displayed in this video from this point forward will be contextually correct. Any deviations from preconceived notions of design are either intentional improvements or are so minute that they are not really deviations at all. Here's what we need to design for in decreasing order of importance. One, the bearing, two, the response, three, the axle. This list is kind of arbitrary, but I think it adequately illustrates the hierarchy of components and explains a lot of design trends we've seen in the industry over time. If you screw up design around your bearing, your yo-yo will not even function. And if it does, it will not be very user-friendly. Screwing up your response, however, is not as bad as you can always just either have custom response made or claim you always meant for it to take flowable response rather than pay even more money for prototypes and remachining of much of your already produced production run. And finally, the axle. As long as you didn't drill the hole for your axle too big or too deep, you can always remachine to a slightly larger axle size. That is not to say that the axle is not a very important aspect of design to take into consideration, but it is possible to have a good playable yo-yo regardless of what type of axle you choose to use as long as it's within reason. With these three components in mind, I'm going to walk you through the design of the modern bearing seat from a logical standpoint, rather than just throwing a sea of numbers at you for you to just regurgitate and copy without knowing what they mean and why they are what they are. As if you made a mistake in typing a number at some point, 
you would have no way of knowing until it was too late. So let's get started with the bearing. The size C yo-yo bearing, which is defined in inches, is 0.1875 inches wide, or 3 16 of an inch wide. And it has an outer diameter of half an inch, or 0.5 inches in diameter, and it has an inner diameter of a quarter of an inch, or 0.25 inches in diameter. Except this isn't actually enough information to make our yo-yo, because now we need to talk about precision. Accuracy and precision are not the same thing. Let's think about archery for a second. A bunch of arrows hitting near the bullseye getting a high score might be accurate, but not precise. Whereas a bunch of arrows grouping right on top of one another might be precise, although it's not accurate as it did not get a very high score. So essentially, precision is how accurately a measurement is made compared to other measurements made. We're going to be back to yo-yos in a second here, so stick with me. Let's say you tell your machinist you want 10 yo-yos made to 50 millimeters wide. But when he comes back with 10 yo-yos, none of them are 50 millimeters wide. Should you be dissatisfied? How close to 50 millimeters are they? How close is close enough? This is a very important question because as it turns out, yo-yos need to be made to a very high precision in order to perform consistently well, especially for the guts of the yo-yo. If you design the inner hole of your bearing and the shaft on which it mounts to be the same diameter as one another, you would have a very bad time. 50% of the possibilities end up with you having no idea if the two parts will fit together, and the other 25% divisions are failure and success accordingly. Except even that success needs to be taken with a gigantic grain of salt, because if the shaft is way too small, then it will fail as a yo-yo despite functioning as a shaft in a hole successfully. In order to know what to call your dimensions out as, you need to know how precise your components and machines are. First of all, standard yo-yo bearings are certified as something called ABEX 7, which is basically just a certification that says, I am this precisely made, I promise. Where the number quantifying precision is called runout, and basically it means, I am only going to be above or below the number I said I was going to be by this much. And second of all, you should know that the majority of lathes which you want to be using to make your yo-yo should be precise to at least two ten thousandths of an inch, or 0 0.0002 inches. And finally, just for the record, lathe is not a verb. You turn something on a lathe. Now that the boring stuff is done, let's get back to the yo-yo business. Here's what we know right now about our manufacturing process, and we need to solve for the unknown. But first, we're going to assume the maximum runout in the worst possible ways, meaning our hole will be smaller than advertised by as much as possible, and our shaft will be larger than advertised by as much as possible. And here we are. We have found the largest possible diameter shaft that our bearing can be guaranteed to fit around. However, given that we don't want to have to apply our bearings with sledgehammers, it's time we use the relatively unknown fact that a slip fit is basically equal to a diameter difference of about half a thousandth of an inch. So we subtract that off and arrive at the final answer for what we will say our shaft diameter is, which is 0 0.2492 plus or minus two ten thousandths of an inch. Using the exact same methodology as we just did, except now keeping in mind that the outer bearing diameter has to be smaller than the outer bearing wall, whose only job is to keep the string in place, meaning it should have enough clearance to allow the bearing to f spin freely of the body. There we have it. Just like that, using neither hand waving nor magic, we have arrived at the proper critical dimensions for our bearing seat. Now it's time to move on toward the next phase, the response. First and foremost, the biggest issue with the response is that unlike the bearing, there is very little non-arbitrary dimensioning to be done. So many companies make their own responses, which are customized to their own yo-yos, which all have responses slightly different from one another, making it so that the response pads are compatible, but they're not what I would call standardized. The most common class of compatibility I see in response is one which is dubbed the 19 millimeter response pad, which has an outer diameter of 19 millimeters and an inner diameter of, well, it varies, as does the depth, being perfectly honest. However, given that most pads which classify themselves under this constant compatibility usually only have issues in terms of their depth, and they all fit within a groove with an inner diameter of 14 millimeters, and I am yet to encounter any which yielded bad performance with a groove deeper than 1.3 millimeters. With all that being said, these are the specs around which I prefer to design my response areas. However, if prototyping with your response of choice results in poorly depth calibrated pad placement, please adjust accordingly probably your depth before either of the diameters. 
Now that we have the dimensions of our pad itself, we can design our groove for it accordingly by simply inflating the outer diameter by 0.2 millimeters and leaving the other dimensions alone because now we're fitting a piece of plastic into the yo-yo and can therefore tolerate quite a bit of deformation. Adding these dimensions in with those we derived in the bearing step, we can now see how far we've come, where everything in black is fully defined and everything in blue is underdefined. But now I'm going to bring up something that the perceptive among you might have been wondering about. What about the gap? The minimum distance between the two yo-yo halves. Surely not all gaps are the same. How do we design our yo-yo to have a specific gap, and what should that gap be? Now that is an excellent question. And before we go any further, we're going to need to answer it. In order to finish our bearing seat, we must now go all the way back to when we drew our box around the yo-yo we wanted to make. And with that at the front of our minds again, we will now have to pull everything back together. Think back to your bearing shaft. I never answered how long it was supposed to be, but we know that it can't be longer than half of the width of the bearing, else the yo-yo halves would run into each other when we screwed the yo-yo together. So let's say we want the shafts to be, to be one millimeter apart when screwed together. We're just going to flex our algebra muscles a bit and convert the width from inches to millimeters and then see that our shaft length should be about 1.8 millimeters. In order to design our yo-yo with the proper width, we need to dimension the face on which the bearing will sit a distance of half the bearing width away from the line of symmetry. After that, all we will have to do is specify a few relatively trivial dimensions like the bearing mounting face outer edge diameter, and the depth of the bearing air release groove, whose functions and importance I will not elaborate upon, but if you want more information, tell me in the comments. With blind faith, trust that they are 8.2 millimeters in diameter and 1.5 millimeters deep respectively, but other dimensions will also yield perfectly functional yo-yos. Finally, we've arrived at the gap. As a rule of thumb determined by moderately simple physics, yo-yos that spin faster ought to have larger gaps. This is because the difficulty required to make a yo-yo bind is inversely proportional to angular velocity. Additionally, yo-yos with a lot of rim weight spin slower than yo-yos with not a lot of rim weight. I would absolutely love to explain why these are the case, but I've been writing a video on that subject for the better part of two years now and I'd rather not this video be any longer than it already is. If your goal is to have a yo-yo which is reasonably sane in its design, it would not be a bad assumption to assume that the gap will be smaller than the width of the bearing. If that is indeed the case, then by offsetting the line connected to the outer bearing wall a known distance, we will use that dimension to control our gap, which is governed by the following equation. In this case, with an offset of 0.2 millimeters, it resulted in a gap of 4.3625 millimeters, an average gap size, if not one which is a little smaller than average. For the third and final component of the guts of a yo-yo, the axle. I must note that the axle may be the least critical component for the guts of a yo-yo. However, it is the only component which can restrict future design choices such as the type of cup you may wish to use, as well as imposing an upper limit on how much rim weight your yo-yo can have. Because of this, the axle, and both its importance and implications, will be the first topic in the next video in the series, Design for Performance. My name is Zach, and this has been Yo-Yo Design 101. Introduction and the guts. Thanks for watching.